So here's my mean max theorem. I have my function, which is continuous, and k is compact, and actually that's, yeah, well, it must be non, well, obviously it must be non-empty, otherwise it doesn't make much sense to consider function on empty set. You can, of course, do that. You can consider function on empty subset, which is compact, of course. There is no argue, uh, argument about that. But on that, on that subset, obviously, function doesn't attain max and mean. So look what the proof says. I need, I'll take the supremum first. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to prove the half of the theorem. I'm going to show you that the max point exists. For the mean point, there are two options. You either can repeat the argument or reduce it to the first part. I'll, I'll discuss that. So let's just see why the max point exists, why the max is attainable. So first I take the supremum. I hope you still remember what's the difference between supremum and the max. Supremum is something which may not be attainable. It's sort of like an upper bound, which is the ultimate upper bound, the lowest possible upper bound. Right? That's, that's what you studied in the first year, did you? Great. So I take a supremum. I give a name to the supremum, M. Now I'd like to just show you what the supremum is. I'm just going to recall the definition from the first year. The definition says it has two parts. Number is called supremum for, for a function if, on one hand, this number always dominates the value of a function. It must be an upper bound for every element. So for every element in my k, the value of my function never exceeds this m. That's the first part. That's the easier part. The harder part, it involves the harder part. It says also for every positive epsilon, I can find a point in my set, which may depend on epsilon, and I reflect this dependence by the sub-index epsilon, you may find a point such that the value of the function get very close to this m. So on the one hand, m is the upper bound. On the other hand, values of the function, you can bring them as close as you wish to your m. Still below, but still as close as you wish. And that's, that's, that's how you put it in play English, the second, second part. Now, I'm going to make a choice for this. It's, it says here, for every epsilon, there is a point like that. I'm going to make a choice of this epsilon. I'm going to choose this epsilon, 1 on n. n is an integer, positive integer. For this epsilon, there must be some x, which depends on that epsilon. And this time, I will call it xn, because eventually it depends on this index n, which makes this property true. Well, I, I, I will combine this together with this property, and I'll put it in one line like this. So the definition of my supremum ensures, once again, that if I choose epsilon 1 on n, there will be points, x sub n, with this property. Look what I'm going to say now. That's the place we're going to use the Balzano Weistrass. It's, it's a typical way how it is used in, in lots of results in, in in analysis. We have Balzana Weistrass, sorry, Weistrass. This sequence, we don't know much about it. We don't know much about it. But Balzana Weistrass ensures that I can find a subsequence, which I gave another name, yk. You see, x and k. I can find a subsequence such that this subsequence, it has a limit. The whole sequence, it may not have a limit, but there will be a subsequence all the time by balzano weistrass which, which is converging. This is because my set is compact. And now I'm going to forget about the rest of the, uh, the rest of the sequence. I'm going to focus only on this subsequence because it has this extra property. It is converging. So what I'm going to say now is this. I'm going to write, I'm going to write up this for my subsequence. Well, I'm actually... First, I'm going to say because f is continuous and this sequence is converging, the value of my function taken on this subsequence only, they will also converge because of the continuity. Continuous functions apply to the converging sequence, returns the converging sequence. So these values, they will converge to f of a. That's a continuity assumption. And now if I take this, I call it asterisk. By asterisk, 
this value m must be this f of a, right? Because the sandwich principle. This number, if you push n to the infinity, or if you push, let me just, yeah, if you push n sub k to the infinity, this goes to m, this is just m, and these values taken over subsequence, they go to here, to f of a. So by the sandwich principle, this f of a we just found, it must be m. And here we go. I took the almost, I, I took the supremum, and I presented you the argument which shows you that there is a point A at which this supremum is attainable. That's why the supremum, as a matter of fact, is uh, max. And as a choice for my x sub max, as a choice for this point, I can take this A we just found. And that finishes the proof. That finishes the proof. So. Any questions? If you want to see the second part of a the theorem for x min, you either can follow similar similar steps, although you need to you will need to replace the supremum with the infimum, or there is a nice nicer trick to do that. Do you know the trick? How we can link the existence of mean to the existence of max? Yes, that's right. We can take another function g equal negative like this, and then the max for one will be mean for the other. 